Hey guys, welcome back. So today, brought home this 5,500 watt Honeywell generator. This one I found on Facebook Marketplace. It was listed for free. According to the description, it doesn't make power. So I didn't really ask any questions other than when can I get it? You know, I haven't done anything to this. I haven't pulled it over or even looked in the tank, but supposedly the engine runs fine. The issue is the no power. So a couple things I noticed right away when picking it up, you know, I guess first off, the circuit breaker is set off. It's tripped. So potentially it's as simple as that. Uh, the other thing is the smell coming from the tank. It actually smells good. It smells like the way fuel is supposed to. So I didn't actually look in the tank, but I can tell from looking at the cap that we don't have any issues in there. And the engine pulls over fine and has good compression. So I don't think we're gonna have any issues with that engine, but I think I'm gonna start there with the engine, just validate that it runs. Usually I don't like starting generators that don't make power because what could happen is that the generator tries to power up it shorts out and that's followed by smoke and fire. But I know he's had it running a few times since it stopped making power and that hasn't happened. And the fact that that circuit breaker was off makes me a little suspicious of what's going on. Uh, this is also electric start, which of course doesn't work. We have a dead battery. Let's check the oil. Plenty of oil, needs to be changed, but we'll worry about that later. So let me get you set up a little bit better. I'm gonna plug in a light to the outlets and we'll try starting this. Confirmed. We have no power output, but the engine, it does sound good. So that at least is something. So I'm going to break out the multimeter. I'm going to test the ohms through the outlets. The way this is set up is that you have two 120 volt legs. They work together to make the 240 volts. So I tested plugging the light into each leg just to make sure because you could have a bad circuit breaker on one side or the other or maybe the coil works on one side and not the other. But in this case, we had no power from either side and the engine did not go under load. So that tells me that the rotor is not powering up. So either the rotor is bad, a bad set of brushes, a bad ABR, or the DPE winding, which supplies power is bad. So that's what we're gonna find out right now. For this test, you just need a multimeter set to measure ohms. And before you test anything, check the resistance of your leads and note what that is because any results you get testing here, you can subtract that resistance from your leads. In my case, it's 0.1 ohms. And that's important because when testing this, a small difference can make all the difference. Now, I don't know what the ohms should be on this generator, but most generators with Honda clones, the resistance is between 0.4 and 0.3. So I'm looking for a value in that area. And in this case, we're at 0.4 ohms, which seems fine. And we'll check the other leg. and we're the same. So that's good. If you don't know what the values should be, they should at least be the same between leg one and leg two. And if you're not sure which leg is which, because sometimes they wire it so that leg one is on the top, leg two is on the bottom, uh, the easy thing to do is to go over here to this outlet and identify the one with the prong. 
that's ground, opposites neutral, and then you have leg one on one side and leg two on the other. So you can test that way. And if you go through these two outer ones, that's gonna go through both coils and you should get twice the value that we saw on each of these legs. So in this case, it's 0.7, which is about double what we saw through the outlets. So there's no smoking gun here. The stator actually looks to be healthy. So we need to get the end off the power head and isolate the windings and do some more extensive testing down there. It's kind of hard to see in here with all this stuff in the way. So I'm going to get the AVR uninstalled so we can get a better look. But what I want to do first is look visually at the stator, make sure I don't see anything burnt or any broken lacing. And from what little I can see, I don't see that. So that is definitely promising. Things look pretty good. The lacing, none of it's broken. I don't see any burnt or broken wires. So that's good. I think I'm gonna start by testing through the brushes to see what the value is on that rotor. It should be between 40 and 70 ohms, but through the brushes, it might be a little higher if the slip rings are dirty. So let's see what we get. and we get nothing. So either the brushes are bad or the rotor is bad. So let's get the brushes out and have a look. Yeah, and I get nothing from that rotor. So what most likely happened is that a wire broke and that rotor needs to be replaced. So I do have extra rotors. I don't know if any of them are compatible with this generator. You know, either way, the power head has to be uninstalled to find out. So I'm gonna start just by draining the fuel from the tank. We'll get the tank out of the way and then move on to getting this power head off. Anyway, I think you get the idea. There's a lot of fuel in the tank, so I'm just gonna let this go until it's all out, and then I'll get that tank off. It took a while, but I got at least $25 of fuel out of that tank. And now that it's out, I can see the bottom of the tank. It looks to be in very good condition.
Before I can get the power head off, there's a few things I need to do. First, the exhaust is attached to the power head, so the exhaust has to be removed. But before I can do that, I have to remove this tin right here so I can access those bolts. So we'll get this off, we'll get the exhaust off, and then we need to disconnect the wires from the power head, and then we can finally get that uninstalled. Before you disconnect the wires, just take note of where everything is. Take a picture, take a video, do what you need to, because you want to make sure you put everything back in the right spot or else all your work might go to waste. Anyway, in this case it's pretty simple, it's gray to gray, red to red, but we have two sets of white wires and most likely it doesn't matter where they go, but to be sure, I'm just going to mark the top white wires. <laughs> My cat just made an appearance with these marks, just so I put everything back 100% where it was. Just loosely putting this back together. Don't want to lose any of the hardware. But I am going to disconnect the wire block so I can get the puller in there. Don't even need a wrench for this one. Anyway, I forgot to put a piece of wood to support the engine because 
these mounts are supporting the weight of the rotor and the stator. And as soon as I remove the stator, it's going to collapse. So I do need to put a piece of wood there to support the engine. So when that stator comes off, the rotor doesn't come crashing down. So there's two spots where the rotor usually fails. One is the connection to the slip ring. You can see there is some corrosion there, but it seems to be connected. The other spot is right here. You can see actually that is exactly where the brake is. These wires are twisted together and then soldered together. And you can see there's a lot of corrosion there. I think that's what caused the failure, most likely from this generator being stored outside or maybe the type of solder used. I'm not sure. I mean, technically, if you reconnect that, it should work again. But yeah, my experience trying to solder this is usually not too good. This wire, despite looking copper, it's usually aluminum and just coated in copper or just colored in copper. So it's really hard to reconnect with any certainty that it's gonna last. So yeah, let's just get this rotor off, see if I have anything else that'll fit. So since I'm not concerned about saving the rotor, there's an easy way to get this off. And it just involves screwing this in most of the way and then hitting it with a large hammer and that'll usually pop it off. And you can use this method for rotors that aren't bad. The only catch is if you miss and hit the rotor, it's now bad. You know, in this case, it doesn't matter. Just like that. So this is the rotor I just pulled off, and these are the two closest ones I have to matching. If you look at the height, it has to match exactly. And this one, unfortunately, it's about a quarter inch too high, and the rotor, it has to be matched to the stator. So that rotor is out, and this other rotor in the back, it's actually the opposite problem. It's about a quarter inch too low. So... I don't have a rotor that I can swap out in this one's place, but I do have a new Ryobi powerhead. It's 5,500 watts, just like that generator requires. So let's give that a try. This stator differs a little in that it has only three wires coming out. The old one, it had four, two of them were white, and the other one was blue and red. So we have to keep that in mind when wiring this together. We need to test this to make sure we know what's going on, but most likely the neutral has just been commoned up into one wire on the stator where it was two on the other. And then we have leg one and leg two as the black wires, but we'll double check that. We'll compare it to the old and just make sure. So let's get the styrofoam off. I'm gonna get this rotor installed, get the stator installed, and then we'll check the wiring before making any final connections. And this rotor bolt I ordered with the power head. It should be the correct length, although it does look a little long. 
Uh oh. Definitely too long. All right, well, let me check my stash. Hopefully I have a shorter one that'll work on this. Found one a little bit shorter. I'm not sure it's gonna be enough. Yeah, I think it is. I'm not sure how I got the wrong bolt. It was ordered together with the stator and rotor, but thankfully this one fits. But that got me thinking about the stator. So I double checked that measurement on the new stator. I thought it was five and a quarter inches, but it's actually five. And the stator I pulled off, I underestimated closer to six inches. So that's a pretty significant difference between the old and the new stator. And that's gonna cause some issues because the exhaust, it's gonna come out an inch too far. And now these mounts down here are gonna be off by an inch. And I can't move it an inch. I'd say half inch at best. And then I'd have to modify those up there. So it's definitely doable. But if I had realized that sooner, I wouldn't have put this power head on. I actually have a Predator power head that dimensionally is much closer. So I'm gonna pull this off. We'll save it for another day and throw that Predator on instead. Gonna get the starter recoil off and get a wrench on the flywheel nut to hold the engine still while I torque down on that rotor bolt. Now is a good time to clean up the slip rings with a piece of Scotch-Brite. Just be careful, you don't wanna nick the wire. There's one on each side. And I'm probably gonna also Scotch-Brite this ball bearing a bit. The bearing is good, but there is a lot of surface rust that might make it difficult when reinstalling. Looks like we're good. The ball bearing, it's seated fully in the end housing. 
and the stator looks to be seated well in that bell housing. So I'm going to add the bolts. I'm going to loosely install them, but I'm not going to torque down on them yet. Once those bolts are installed, I'm going to remove that wood, tighten the stator to these mounts, and then torque it down. And before proceeding, I'm going to get that spark plug out, pull the engine over, and just make sure there's no contact between that stator and rotor. Perfect. This power head is just a little longer, but I'm going to try fitting the exhaust and see if things line up. There is a bit of a gap between the pipe and the head. So I'm gonna to try to cinch this in. You know, I don't wanna to go too crazy, but I think it might pull in without having to modify anything.
I think I got pretty lucky with this exhaust. I wasn't counting on it fitting due to the fact that this power head is a little bit longer, but it worked out. And that's a good thing because the matching Predator exhaust for that power head, I was going to use assuming that it would fit better. But then I noticed this engine, it is a Hemi engine and the head is a lot wider than the one that came on the Predator originally. So although this exhaust would have bolted up fine to the head because it's so much wider, the exhaust would have been sticking out, I'd say by at least an inch. Anyway, I think we're just about ready to move on to the wiring. I'm gonna just reinstall the plug real quick, get this back on, and then finalize that wiring. The Predator Stator, it has four wires coming out of it, just like the original Honeywell. And the top two come out the same sleeve. That should be leg one. We'll just double check the resistance. It should be about 0.4, which it is. And we'll double check the bottom one. And we get the same. So that's good. And these are the wires going up to the control panel. We got the two white wires, which are most likely neutral and bonded together in the control panel. So we can test that real quick. They are connected, no connection to red or gray. And the ground, most likely it is bonded, which it is. So the two white wires in the ground, they are all common together. So it should be safe to connect the white wires to the white wires coming out of the stator, and then the red and the gray to the red and the black. And then of course ground goes right to ground, and we should be good. The wires coming from the control panel, they're cut in such a way that it's expecting the white wires to be on the ends rather than the middle. So I'm gonna to try to flip these wires so that we get a better fit. I'm gonna use the brushes from the Honeywell generator, not from the Predator one, because they are worn out quite a bit. But I am gonna use the AVR from the Predator. Not that the Honeywell one won't work, but the Predator one is probably already adjusted to produce 120 volts with this power head. 
So it might save a little bit of time. Make sure you plug the red wire or the positive on the left. It is polarity sensitive. If you get it backwards, it's not going to cause damage, but the generator may not power up. That's it. This should make power. So I'm going to put a little bit of fuel in the carburetor. We'll start it real quick. Just make sure. These down here, they are extra windings that the Predator used, but this generator doesn't. One of them is for the fuel solenoid, which this does not have. And the other one, I think, is for DC output on the control panel and battery charging, which this doesn't have either. So I'm going to leave these uh, disconnected since we're not going to use them. Not too bad. It scared me for a second because the light, it didn't come on, but the switch was turned off. So once it was turned on, I could see we had output both on leg one and leg two. The engine speed was a little slow and the voltage was a little high. So both of those do need to be adjusted, but I've got the information I need. This is a good running generator now and it's doing what it should. So I'm going to place an order. I want to get a new battery ordered up. And I'm going to change the oil now. It looked pretty dark and I want to get it changed while the engine's hot. Well, I'm down here, I'm going to get the battery out, but I noticed the terminals, they both seem to be loose. So potentially the battery isn't bad, but they usually are. But let's just double check. Yeah, 0.4 volts, it's bad.
couldn't help but notice when doing the oil change, but the feet are missing and we're just left with a bolt there. Kind of stabbed a hole in the oil tray and caused a leak. So both feet are like that. So I'm gonna get these off and put uh, new ones on. That's a lot better. It's sitting nice and level now. Anyway, there's not much I wanna do now. I wanna wait for the battery, get that installed. So I'm gonna hold off on load testing it. Now, I've been cleaning this as I go. The control panel though, it still needs a lot of work. I've tried a few different chemicals like acetone, gasoline, rubbing alcohol, bleach to clean this up and really nothing is working too well, except a product I have called Goof Off and some Scotch-Brite. That's the clean spot you see right there, but it is gonna take a lot of elbow grease. It's just not coming off very well. So I'm gonna work on that a bit and the tank as well. I wanna get those labels off. They are pretty damaged from the sun and I don't think they're really adding any value at this point. So I'm gonna heat those up, try to peel those off and then I'll attack this with a little bit of scotch bright and goof off. This is removing a little paint, which probably isn't a bad thing. This tank looks pretty bad. Yeah, not too bad. I didn't think it was gonna clean up this well, but it's coming out pretty good.
It's better. It does need more work. You know, I'm not sure what this stuff is, but it's really embedded in the plastic. It's hard to get off, but it's already looking a lot better. I'm now the proud owner of a Mighty Max battery. It's 30 bucks on Amazon. Perfect. Looks like there's a little damage to this line here. This is actually not the fuel line. The fuel line connects there. This is a tank vent. There's actually a tube that runs up through the tank, almost to the top. And instead of venting through the cap, it vents through here to the air box. Now, something happened to this one. Looks like maybe it was nibbled into two. So I'm gonna get this off. We'll put a new line in its place and connect it to the air box once the tank is reinstalled. This is where the tank vent connects. Does that look clogged? I'm not sure. I'm gonna double check that. I'm gonna try to pressurize this with the Mighty Vac. This should be a tank vent. It should flow easily from the tank into the air box. And when I pump it up, it should go right down but you can see it is slowly moving down, but I should not be able to build any pressure. So let me grab a zip tie, try to poke around the corner and hopefully clear that plug. Actually, I'm gonna start with a drill bit because when I twist it, if there's any material in there, it'll bring it out instead of in to the air box. And you can see, I think, there is some dirt or something. And I'm gonna have to open up the air box too because there's gonna be some dirt pushed through but the zip tie goes through now. So let's double check with the Mighty Vac. Yeah, it's better. It's not building any pressure, so 
If this had gone unnoticed, it would have caused a run issue because as the fuel leaves the tank, it has to replace it with air. And if it can't breathe, it'll actually create a vacuum in the tank and the fuel won't advance to the carburetor unless you put the generator in the sun, in which case it's going to build pressure in the tank and it's going to push past the needle and seat if you're lucky and flood the carburetor. If you're not lucky, it's going to keep building pressure until that tank inflates like a balloon. Let's make sure the air box is clear. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's a little something down there, so... Yeah, let me just turn the choke on. I'm gonna blow that dust out of there, but it doesn't look too bad in here. Just about ready to test this, but before I do, I need to make a few adjustments. The voltage, it was high at 134 volts, and the engine speed was a little slow at around 59 hertz. So I'm going to pop that AVR off, we'll dial that potentiometer back a half a turn to start, and see where that gets us. All right, let's try that. The voltage didn't change much, maybe a volt with a half a turn. So I'm going to need at least four or five turns. So let's start with two. And see what we get. getting pretty close. I'm going to do two more turns counterclockwise. It'll still be above 120 volts, but I'd rather have it a little on the high side than on the low side.
Not too bad. The engine speed, it held just fine under a 5,000 watt load. It was just over 59 hertz with room to spare. And the voltage held steady as well at 123 volts. So I think those issues are sorted out. I can get that AVR reinstalled and get the end cap on the power head. But there are other issues. When under load, even a 1500 watt load, the engine does start to surge and giving it a little bit of choke makes that surge go away. So it's not getting enough fuel. Most likely the main jet is a little bit dirty or has to be opened up a bit. So I'm gonna get that uncover on. I'm gonna drop the bowl on the carburetor, take a look at that jet and see if we can't get the engine running a little better. This was one of the rare times I thought I wasn't going to have to clean the carburetor since it was advertised as a good running engine that didn't make power. And it does run good without a load. But the fact that it's not running well under a load tells me that the carb is definitely a little bit gummed up. So I'm going to try to do the easy thing. I'll just drop the bowl, clean the jet, and I'll try to pop up the pilot jet as well and go through that. Anyway, let's see if the jet will come out. Main jet looks good, does not appear to be clogged. So let's get the pilot out. Yeah, nothing obvious other than a bit of debris and what came out and a little bit of debris in the bowl, but not too bad. The pilot jet also looks to be clear. So my best guess is either the jets are a little bit lean on this engine and they need to be opened up, or maybe a little bit of debris was just kind of getting in the way. So I'm gonna go through both the jets with a wire and spray some carb cleaner in, get all the little pieces of dirt out of there, and we'll try it again. Okay, let's try that.
That was a lot better. Not perfect, but much better. Before I cleaned the carb, it was surging pretty much at any load. And this time I was able to bring it up to 4,000 watts without issue, but I did get a surge at around 5,000 watts. And that went away at 5,500 watts and stayed away at 6,000 watts, which is over the rated load of this generator. So I'm pretty satisfied with the engine and the way it's running. It has plenty of power and of course, it's making power now. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching. Well, editing this video together, I realized I forgot a minor detail that could really cause a lot of problems. The connector for the AVR, it should be zip tied in place because the wires could get sucked in by the rotor. And if that happens, it's gonna take out the rotor and take out the stator. I've seen it happen before. This connector right here has to be secured. The way this was secured on the original Predator installation was just a zip tie kind of around everything right here, holding it together. But, you know, sometimes they're also secured right here with this specialty zip tie, but I'm just gonna do it the same way that it was originally. And while I'm at it, might as well secure these as well. Because even though they're not used, they will take out the power head if they get sucked in. Now I'm done.